guys. Happy Friday and welcome to season four of the Collaboration Conversation, a listener supported video podcast where Christian artists, entrepreneurs and friends share about their upcoming projects and how they are using the gifts and talents that God has given them. To what end, of course, is always to share the good news of King Jesus. Amen. Today, we are so excited to have Luke Wright with us. Luke is a junior high school English teacher and the author of the young adult books, The Devouring and The Raging. Even though we have never met before, we are connected to Luke through my dad because they taught together at Hillsboro. Luke, thank you so much for being here and welcome. Thank you. I am thrilled to be here. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Um, yeah. This is going to be great. Thank you so much for inviting me. I really appreciate it. Let's do this. Absolutely. Yeah, this will be fun. This will be fun. So uh, we mentioned earlier that that we are we are now virtually meeting. Uh, We've been back and forth with some communication, Um, and I wanted to just tell our listeners kind of uh, just a little bit of uh, a background because we get the question all the time: How do you get your guests? Yes. And so I was in the living room, and we were watching uh, Jeopardy, which is so embarrassing to admit that. Um, but anyway, so Jeopardy ended, and I said to to my husband, to Billy, I said, "You know, I need I need some uh, some suggestions. Anybody you know that could be on our podcast? Any authors or musicians that you know?" And he said, "Luke Wright." I mean, immediately. I was like, "Wait, what?" I, you know, of course, I'd not heard your name before. And I was like, who is that? And how do you know him? And so, of course, he went in, into telling all the details. But it was so funny. I mean, it was immediate. It he, was yeah. kind of a God download. So I got on. Uh, well, he. And our best. We always get some really good guests from dad. Oh, was, yeah. Totally. Absolutely. Um, and he, I think, messaged you on Facebook. And then you and I messaged. So mm-hmm. from there, it just, it progressed. We um, love when, when God downloads. Oh, yeah. Guests. It, it's options awesome. to us. Well, so since we don't know you very well, and our listeners might not, if you wouldn't mind, just take a few minutes and tell us a little bit about yourself and your family. Well, first, I'm so glad that your husband even remembered me. My goodness. So that's really cool. <laughs> oh, no, not at all. He, he, you know, obviously he loves teaching. He's been out there yeah. 20, 20 some years. So yeah, you, you definitely stood out in his mind. Uh-huh. So cool. I love it. Well, I have been married to Francesca Wright for almost 18 years now. Oh, Congrats. Yay. Yeah, we're coming on 18 years. It's been wonderful. She is fantastic. We have two little daughters, Emma, who's eight, Tess, who's five. Uh, Emma right now is in second grade. Tess will be going into kindergarten. Oh, next year. sweet. <laughs> yeah, they're, they are a lot of, they're a handful. A handful, a I'm sure. Are, yeah, the joy of my life. They are absolutely wonderful. So, yeah, right now I live in Bakersfield. I grew up in Santa Clarita, which is about an hour and a half south of Bakersfield. But when okay. I got married, I came up to uh, this city because this is where my wife is from. Okay. And, and uh, eventually, I got into teaching. And I've taught anywhere from first grade all the way to eighth grade. And I absolutely love teaching. It's a fantastic job. So I'm, you know, I'm going to pursue that you know, year after year after year. And that's been a wonderful experience. So currently I'm teaching. I'm teaching at the junior high level, English, at a school called Tevis Junior High. I have a wonderful principal. It's a great school. My students are awesome. And uh, yeah, I'm just happy with my family. I'm happy where we live. I'm happy with what I do. Mm. I'm very blessed. That is awesome. That's very cool. I want to affirm something real quick. We, um, at the first episode of this season, we had my dad as a guest, which was really cool. And um, he was talking about how important it is and how we rarely see male teachers in the elementary and middle school ages and just how important it is to see that. Not that there aren't obviously phenomenal female teachers, um, but just like having, having a male figure in that age range is so important. And so I just want to say thank you for pursuing that. Like that's such a noble thing to do. Um, and I'm grateful for that. That's awesome. Well, and especially when they're godly men. Yeah. Oh my gosh, for sure. Well, and it's honestly, it's my pleasure. And you will hear female teachers, especially at the elementary level, saying we do need more male teachers yeah. at this level teaching students. So um, I've heard that before. I wish it was different, but, yeah. you know, it is what it is. It yeah, is. Yeah, I hear you. Well, and you, and you just, I feel like, especially at the middle school, you got to be called by God. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> there's, you know, Billy, Billy's great with the middle school age. So mm-hmm. I raised the kids until they got to middle school. Then I handed them off to him. And then when Smart. they, be, yes. And then when they got their senses back at high school, then I, <laughs> I got back involved. I'm kidding. I know. But, um, 
Oh, middle school is just a, that's just a crazy it's a tough age. Well, so how did you get from from Bakersfield to, to Franklin and then back? Oh, OK. Well, that's quite a story. Uh, so a few years ago, my wife and I were thinking about moving out of California. Where should we go? And uh, she did a lot of research. Uh, that's her M.O. Yeah. And she came across uh, Nashville, Tennessee, Williamson County. And she loved it. And I fell in love with the place, too, as far as, you know, the demographics. What What's not about. to love? Yeah. It, it, and Tennessee is beautiful. Objectively yeah. speaking, it is beautiful. It's not for me. But it's yeah. cool. <laughs> Fair. Uh, so we went out there a few years ago. And honestly, I hate to admit this. Okay, I really do. But I was thinking about going into the private sector. Okay. And I lasted five seconds, if that. <laughs> <laughs> Right back into teaching. I was so happy that Mr. Gish at Hillsboro hired me on. Uh, and then I got a fifth grade gig teaching math. Nice. Which, honestly, I loved doing. It was nice to be teaching math. And it, it was small class, fun school, great, great students, great teachers. Yay. But going throughout that year, I was like, okay, I don't feel this is the place for me. Mm. Uh, I, Diane, you and I had chatted how yeah. I just had this lonesome feeling. I was just like, wow, I cannot shake the lonely feeling. I want to go back. Yeah. And so eventually we did, which yeah. sadly it was hard on my wife, uh, more hard, you know, more difficult for her than for me. Uh, but you know what? She, yeah, she took yeah. over the team. And That's great. Back to California, and I jumped right back into teaching. But the, then at the seventh grade level at Tevis Junior High. Okay. Yeah. Well, but and you're you're closer to family. Yes, exactly. Yeah, uh, that's gotta be good. Family. Yeah. I, I miss the familiarity of everything. Totally. Honestly, I don't know how you guys can take the trees. I used to joke with people. <laughs> Tennessee is like you walk out the door and someone takes a branch and shoves it in your face. <laughs> <laughs> We like oxygen here. We just really enjoy the oxygen production. It well, does come with some pollen, but pollen, yeah, the yeah, pollen. We're a, in pollen season, and I can't. Yeah, yeah. That that actually killed my wife was the pollen. Yeah, um, but yeah. okay. Again, beautiful place. I, I love what Tennessee's about. Yeah. Uh, um, and uh, but it just did not work out. Well, next time y'all ever come visit, y'all gotta hang out in Chattanooga. Chattanooga is the place to be. <laughs> If you we went there know. a couple times. Yeah, and, uh, yeah, it's it is nice. We you love. Know? I'm that's where we are currently okay. filming. That's is where in she lives. Yeah. yeah, and I love it. And I I moved from Nashville to L. A. to Chattanooga, and Chattanooga is where I will stay. I love Chattanooga forever, forever. Good place. Yeah, yeah, good for you. I love it. Well, so um, so you went you like you, you mentioned you went back into the private sector, back to teaching. So teaching obviously is what really grounds. Um, grounds you and, and it's it's your basis of what you do but you're also an author which I think is awesome we love um, talking with folks who um, who you know have have the day job where they're using their talents and the gifts but then they also have their other thing that they do that's also using their talents and gifts we love that we love using them in every facet of life so mm-hmm. talk to us a little bit about how you became an author how that got started when did you get bit by the writing bug all that good stuff okay well it's quite a process um you know, there's no definitive moment in my life like, oh, I was 14 and said, I'm going to be a writer. Okay. Nothing like that. Okay. Um, during my college days, I would mess around actually with poetry, writing lyrics um, for this one Christian band. And I loved doing that. And it was very, for a very short period of time. Uh, but I loved the idea of poetry, lyrics, music, rhyme, all that good stuff, and trying to tell a story through, through, yeah. the, song, through the song. So that. I love doing. It was great. And fast forward ahead, maybe about 10 years, five, 10 years. I really fell in love with John Grisham and his books, his novel, his legal thrillers. Oh, yeah. And I love the idea of, okay, here we have a writer where it just flows when you're reading. It's just page after page. I mean, it, you, the writing flows. It's so fluid. How did he accomplish this? Yeah. What's his technique? How do you do this? So I became very curious about that. Um, that definitely got me intrigued with storytelling and writing and, you know, the idea of becoming a, an author. Yeah. Uh, something else that was very motivating. I mean, so you got the poetry, you got the prose writing, you got John Grisham. 
you got other things that I'm coming across that I'm reading that I'm liking. Think, okay, this is a a format that I really, really appreciate. And this is something that I can use to really communicate significant truths. That's that's another thing that I love about storytelling. Uh, the fictional writing, I can take an idea that um, is true, is important, that I want young people to know, and I can show them how it plays out within a story. And I think that is powerful. I think it's meaningful. And it's something that obviously I'm excited about and really enjoy doing. Well, that's awesome. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about the books. Um, what was your inspiration, you know, to f- for this story? Which we have here. On this, <laughs> yes. Which I yeah, have I your book. We have them here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you for doing that, by the way. Absolutely. Uh, let's go backwards. I'll start with the raging. Uh, okay. Uh, with the raging, definitely an influence with sports. Uh, yes. I come from a sports family. Uh, in fact, my oldest brother, Nate, he, he almost made it to the major leagues. He was an excellent baseball player, excellent wow. soccer player. Yeah. So I come from a family where sports was uh, definitely something we did, we enjoyed. It was yeah. great. So I took that knowledge and used it uh, kind of as the background for yeah. the race. Well, and we're a baseball family, yes. so we love so that. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> perfect, perfect. Yes. Um, and then other things, even uh, another driving factor for The Raging, writing that book was, first, I wanted to write something for junior hires. The first book, The Devouring, it's for fourth through sixth grade. And um, I've always wanted, when I wrote that, I felt a little too confined, the vocabulary, mm-hmm. uh too simplistic. Sure. It just wasn't quite working for me as well. And I knew that junior high, seventh, eighth grade, that could be my niche. Yeah. And that was another motivating factor. Furthermore, something else that was very motivating was the idea, okay, connected to baseball. We have our main character, Michael Sutton, who's in a slump. How do we get him out of it? And I, I went with kind of a psychological route. And yep. yet at the same time, it was it, it's connected to Christianity. And I was getting at the idea because you have um, Matt, Matt King, who's the great baseball player of Hawthorne. Hawthorne, of course, is the city within the raging where everything takes place. And he's giving Michael advice on, look, this is how we're going to get you out of your slump so you guys can win it all. And the idea is you have to already basically assume that you're perfect before you play the game that you're going to play. Now, he, of course, that character puts it in his own way, his own terms and everything. That's a fascinating idea. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a religious idea, and I wanted to use that and connect it to sports. So I, that was another motivating, inspirational factor when it came to writing that story. Yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. So the, there's the raging. Um, and then backing up, the devouring. Wow. Uh, whew, what inspired that? How that gets started? Childhood. Guilt courage. Mm. Um, I definitely love the idea. In fact, it's dedicated to um, Randy Martin. He right now, he, he he still is my spiritual mentor, but he right now lives in North Carolina, North Carolina. Okay. Um, the idea is justice. So I, again, powerful justice, working it within a story. I wanted to kind of see, okay, when people finish with the devouring, fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth graders, how will they respond to what one of the main characters of the story does in connection with justice? Is it right or wrong? Is it unjust? Is it just? Is it good? What do you think? And that was a huge motivator. Now, to be honest, that was a motivating factor later on as I had already started writing The Devouring. Okay. Um, That kind of eventually took some traction. And I love that it came about. And it's something where, uh, again, to the gentleman who I uh, dedicated to, Randy Martin, he would argue, if, once you finish that story, what Breckenridge does, and I, I won't give too much away, is absolutely just. The, one, the antagonist, Warren, gets exactly what he deserves. Right. I think that's a fascinating topic to discuss and yeah. um, something to take seriously. Because right. I, I think a lot of young people don't know what we mean by justice. We don't mean mercy. We don't mean grace. We're talking about something else. And I try to have that play out within the story. And that was a lot of fun. And yeah. um, it was an interesting process for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so one of the words that I think you've used, um, and that's kind of where I got it, was dark. The, the, the first one especially is a little bit dark 
maybe in nature. You know what? You know what? What made you think I'm going to go justice route? You know to to paint this picture. Mm. Well, wait, first with the dark side of things. Yeah. Right? What is I? I find it entertaining. And I, sure. And I know kids do as well. Okay. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> totally fair. Yeah. You find it entertaining, so you kind of already got that hook with them. Yeah. Um, and then in light of with that dark background, um, to me, it's where you can reveal virtue. You can show courage. You can show loyalty. You can show perseverance. Um, and you definitely see that with Michael Sutton as he develops throughout. I mean, he only develops so much. I'm not that great of a writer. It's not <laughs> like I really develop this overwhelming wow you see this total shift from cowardice to courage it's done in a limited fashion sure I totally agree that. um but I, I what i really love is the relationship between michael and jordy because jordy towards the end of the story she really steps up and yes. defends michael and yeah. shows a lot of courage in a very dangerous situation so i love the idea of okay yeah this is kind of dark but at the same time yeah. there's so there's so much redemptive value from the story. It's worth it. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. So cool. Well, and another theme, I think, um, and, and um, I just, I find that, that, that there's a trust uh, factor and that, that, you, that the trust that's built between the two of them carries on even with Breckenridge into the second story, you know? Yes. So yeah, that's, yeah. that's great. Yeah. And then we, there we have a, a turn of events because Jordy's a powerful character, and then I put her more in the background for the second book. Right. Yeah. Um, she's still definitely a part of it, and yes, you see the relationship to to whatever degree uh, develop more between Breckenridge and her. And then, of course, you got to ask the question: Why is Breckenridge so um, parental, if you will, towards Jordy? What's going on? Well, there's a backstory to that that I haven't even revealed yet that I hope to within the third book. So right, right. There's a lot of things that I can, uh, because they're both so focused, uh, there's a lot more that I can develop and still explore. So I'm excited right. about that. Well, so let's go ahead and jump into that. Yeah. You, 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 men- you mentioned this third book, but you're thinking novel this time. Yes. I, uh, <laughs> Didn't mean to overwhelm you. <laughs> yeah, it's like, uh, you know, if I say it, this is even being recorded. I'm going to say it. People are gonna be like, you said. You said you, it. It's like your junior high students, my junior high students. You said, Mr. Wright. Yeah. Uh, well, we're not making you pick a date. That's true. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll, I, I'm hoping, that's the key word now, hoping, um, the spring of 2023. That's what Good. I'm shooting for. Now, nice. This, I have not typed out a single word, but I've been thinking about it. I, I've got it pretty much laid out in my head. And in fact, I had one of my students from, uh, which band is it? Aerosmith, and I, I won't give her name because it's just, yeah, privacy reasons. Okay. But she created, uh, she's already kind of helped with the cover of the book. Wow, okay. very cool. Well, Which I wish I brought. Um, yeah. I, oh, I, yeah. In my classroom, I'm like, ah. <laughs> Well, you, you probably need to clarify here for our listeners what that means, that you name your classes by uh, rock bands. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> that's a I, little was, I was a little confused. I was like, I'm sure this makes sense somewhere. So sorry. So I, I have basically four classes. Yeah. And um, I give them all rock band names. We've that's so Earth cool. Smith, we've got Guns N' Roses, Bon Jovi, and Queen. <laughs> and each of the two of the bands, for example, Aerosmith and Guns N' Roses, they compete against each other when it comes to different types of, of tests. Mm. So uh, the kids get into it and uh, it's a lot of fun. And I think they take ownership of the fact of who they are yeah. and track down the other band, hopefully in a friendly way. Friendly yeah. way. Yeah. It, it's, it's just good competition. In fact, I remember when I was teaching at another school, when I was doing the same thing, yeah, uh, had, had my bands I, in that case. Uh, well, one of them was guns N' roses. So this was you know five years ago and I'm teaching in class. And my classroom was way out by the field, PE field, baseball field, and all that. And I was in a portable. And all the, you know, I'm teaching, and all of a sudden I hear this chanting from you know five, six, seven guys, and they're just like guns and roses, guns <laughs> and roses, and they take total ownership of it. And of course, I burst through, you know, out the door, and I'm saying guns and roses. And so I, that's I, awesome. 
Um, you know, I probably embarrass my students more than I should, but uh, it's a lot of fun and it creates just kind of some, let's just say some uh, friendly capitalism within the educational world. Some good Excellent. competition. Yeah. Good. Well, That's so awesome. We, we, I'm grateful that you clarified, but let's finish back to the, to the Breckenridge book. Okay. So yeah, well, here, I'll give you the title. Uh, it's called Breckenridge, the broken God. And uh, it's really going to obviously focus on him, which right. is the most mysterious and probably powerful character of all the characters within, you know, the devouring, the raging. Uh, he really stands out. In fact, I got a lot of good feedback from people like, okay, you need to, Explore this. Yeah. Yeah. This guy is cool. What is he all about? Because he's still, even though he's, especially in the raging, he starts to do things. Mm -hmm. Right. Cool. Uh, It's still like, what? Who is this? What's going on? So I have all that mystery that I want to reveal. And yet I'm hoping at the same time that while I'm revealing this character to my readers, that it's still just so mysterious. I just love that. Yeah. he, he definitely is. Yeah. Well, good. That's awesome. That's so cool. Well, um, so if you didn't know, um, our podcast, um, the collaboration conversation is, I don't know, I've never introduced it like that before. <laughs> that was weird. But our, our podcast is part of a minute is part of our ministry that we started, um, that we, it was kind of, it was inspired by, um, a NT Wright's book surprised by hope. And he paints this beautiful picture of God's building his kingdom. And we have the honor to get to collaborate with him on our brick that he's going to use in building his kingdom. And so this brick is so important. It's the one thing that, that we get to do um, in collaboration with God as he builds his kingdom. And so we we believe that um, you know, so many things go into building your brick, your vocation, um, the books you write, all, all of these things, your kids, your family. Um, but one big aspect of it is your talents and your gifts. And we believe in naming those, in cultivating them and developing them um, so that we can build our brick. We can do the good works that, that God has planned for us in advance to do through Christ Jesus. And and so anyway, that's just big, big picture. So you kind of know why we are asking about talents and gifts specifically. Um, but that's kind of why we focus on that. And um, so, yeah, we love encouraging our guests and our listeners to tap into their talents and gifts. And we would love to hear from you. Obviously, writing is one, right? obviously. Teaching. But um, we would love to hear from you what you think your God-given talents and gifts are. It, it would be teaching and writing. Yeah. Um, both which I enjoy immensely. The teaching, um, I've, I've gotten down. Um, there's always room for improvement. In fact, I've been thinking about next year already and what I'm going to change and how I'm going to uh, upgrade things. The writing is still definitely, it's still at the novice level, but I feel like it's really developing, especially when I was writing The Raging. When I was writing that, I truly felt like, in fact, I was telling my editor, L.A. Mueller, wonderful lady. In fact, she's She's one of my cousins, and she's fantastic. Oh, nice. Yeah, she she helped me with the book. She was very encouraging, and um, she definitely knows more about writing than I do, and her advice was terrific. By the way, to any writers out there, find a good editor and mm. listen to them. Yes, yes. good <laughs> advice. Good advice. <laughs> yeah. Um, so when I was you know, speaking of talents, typing out the raging felt natural, I felt like I was really putting on some writing muscle, if you will. I definitely understood what I was doing, point of view, how to develop things. And then what's great, because I actually read The Raging to my, my students at Tevis Junior High, and you start to see problems as you're reading. You're like, oh, I could have, that doesn't sound quite right. Or you know what, um, I need to extend this a little bit longer. Or uh, this is underdeveloped, and it, which is a fantastic thing. I'm, I'm First of all, I'm happy that my students are willing to put up with me. Also, <laughs> it's a great way to improve as a writer because you see your, you see your blind spots. Mm. And um, being able to recognize where you haven't performed well, I think that is another way to show, oh, your talent's growing. You're mm. able to see yeah. where you need to improve. Also, I feel like now I'm at a point where I know how to actually improve it. So I'm definitely excited about the third work. So, um, yeah. Teaching. I writing. Yeah, I would also um, add in their communication. 
I'm, you're, I mean, I'm sure that sometimes goes, well, I'm a good communicator, but I'm a terrible teacher. So <laughs> they don't always go hand in hand. Um, but just, just in this conversation, I, you are just a very well spoken, very, you communicate very clearly. Um, and so I definitely, yeah. that's a talent for sure. And I, I think that goes somewhat hand in hand with the teacher. You know, you're, you're having to communicate these ideas sure. to these kids. And I love that you read the books to them. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is so cool. I mean, I can't even imagine how cool that would be to have your teacher write, read you a book in class. He's wrote. I mean, that, that, that would, is really cool. That would, that would, that would, That's yeah. another thing with, uh, in fact, uh, on my ELA team, one of the teachers said, yeah, because I, I felt, I felt strange about reading my book to my students. Like, is this self-centered? Is this self-serving? Is this weird? And she's like, that is a wonderful idea. You have to do that. The yes. kids are like, dude, my teacher who wrote this book is reading it to me. That's a yes. great experience for them. Stop thinking yeah. about yourself. They love it. <laughs> yeah, totally. I agree. That is so cool. Well, um, while we're at it, talking about talents and gifts and and who gave them to us, um, mm-hmm. I I always in this season we've we've started this new thing where we want to encourage our guests to share with our listeners just one thing about Jesus. If they could share one thing about him, what would it be? What do you think? <laughs> Here's my one thing, and it may seem a little odd, but I truly believe this in connection with Jesus. You can't, and, I, and I'm saying can't, you can't do what he did. Mm. Mm. You, he comes and lives the perfect life under the law of God. Yeah. yeah. I know I can't. And I honestly know no one else can. Totally. And that's what I want people to see about Jesus. Yeah. No matter how hard you try, no matter how good you think you are, no matter what you do, no matter how long you pray, no matter what your pedigree is, mm. your bank account, you can't do what he did. Yeah. Ain't that the yeah. truth? He is, um, he is amazing. You know, you're right. What Absolutely. He, what he did is next level. Oh, supernatural. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Good word. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for for our listeners who may not know Jesus or um, who may not have a relationship with them, we have uh, curated some resources for you. You can head over to projectbrickworks.org slash Jesus uh, to learn more. We would love to chat with you. You can schedule a one-on-one to chat with us about him and, and just learn all the ways that he can drastically and radically and supernaturally change Amen. your life. Yeah. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that you guys knew about those resources. Well, so one of the things that we ask our our guests prior to this as we prepare is, um, is there a topic that you would like to talk about that we wouldn't normally just ask? And you said yes. Just very often. That doesn't happen. Yeah, people are like, <laughs> no, uh, no, no idea. You know, that's fine. But you said you wanted to share about what's missing in the presentation of the gospel within American Christianity. Mm-hmm. Can, yes. you, can you um, share with us about that? Absolutely. This I'm excited about, for sure. Uh, Okay, within American Christianity, often, and I I understand this, we emphasize the death of Christ, that Jesus died for you. Um, He has washed away your sins. You are now not guilty, objectively speaking, which uh, yet, amen, a thousand times. Right. What I think is missing uh, with several uh, American Christian churches is, wait a second, that is good news, but there's much more. And that is not only does Jesus, that, that's what we call his passive obedience, him dying on the cross for your sins. Amazing, wonderful. We should be eternally grateful. And At the are, same yeah. time, let's not forget what he did from the virgin birth up into the cross, if you will. Okay. Mm. That's his active obedience. And people need to see, Christians need to see, That you not only, when it comes to God, and I don't like putting it this way, but I'll just do it for the sake of convenience. Um, Why should God allow you into his kingdom, or let's say into heaven? We'll we'll keep the kingdom here down on earth. Why should he allow you into heaven? And if it's simply because, well, Jesus died for me, died for my sins, I'm innocent. That's not enough. You're innocent, but you you have not done any good. You have not kept the law. Um, and, and what I was getting at earlier is, and you can't keep the law. That's the point. The law exposes your sin. 
drives you to despair. And hopefully in that despair, you reach out to Jesus. Yes. Not to yourself, not to your family, not to your country, not to a system, not to some ism that you reach out to Jesus because he's the one. Mm-hmm. Again, th- this isn't technically putting it right, but from his virgin birth to his death, he's the one that's obeying all of those laws. He's the one loving God with all his heart, with all his mind, with all his soul, mm-hmm. he's the one loving his neighbor as himself. These are things that you and I, we, we can't do for five minutes. Right. <laughs> it's so true. Yeah. And he, he did it for, let's you know say, 30 years. Right. Yeah. And you need all those works. And if you believe in that, if you say, you know, I'm going through faith, accept the work of Christ. What's so cool that we see in the book of Romans is when you do that, you're actually fulfilling the law of God through faith in Christ, because Christ has accomplished all that for you on your behalf. Yeah. That. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. It's great stuff. Oh, totally. Well, no, I'm glad you shared that. One, one of my favorite scriptures, and I teach VBS every year to fifth or sixth graders, and we talk about this a lot, is the, the, the passage in Matthew 25, where uh, the, the, it's a, kind of a scene with Jesus on the throne, and it's the sheep and the goats. And it, you know, while grace and, and and we always talk about Jesus is the ticket, you know, because these are mm. little kids. Jesus is the ticket. You, gotta, you have to have the right ticket. But at the same time, you know, we're called to, to feed the hungry and to clothe the naked and to visit those who are in prison, you know, and, and to do all of these things. There is so much more um, to our relationship with Jesus as yeah. we demonstrate our love for him by being a, 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 a vessel of mercy to, to those around us. So, oh, yeah. so yeah, we, we, we talk about, we talk about, there's just, there's just a lot of, of great um, things that we get to do to be a blessing to others. Absolutely. And the, you know, cause someone might come along and say, wait, if Christ has done it all, why do I have to do anything? Which it, I think a person who's approaching it that way, first of all, they're, they're not, ha- they're missing the point. They're missing the mark. I yeah. When you, yeah. When you have the death of Christ, and you have the work of Christ, and you're trusting in that, it is motivating. That mm. You are so grateful. You are motivated to love God, yes. to love others, and have those, you know, yeah. kind of those blessings on others through whatever it might be. Absolutely. Totally. I, I was talking about this. Um, I can't remember. It's probably with Dad, I would imagine. Um, and we just were talking about how when, when you experience, when you actually experience the love of God and the mercy and the grace of our savior, right? Mm-hmm. So you have all of the, the, the foundational aspects of it. And when you live into that, it then starts pouring out of you. It's not a one-time deal. You have to live into that daily. We're going to fail daily and thank God that his mercies are new every morning. But once you're living into that, then, yeah. then all of those, those good works, they come naturally. They, they flow out of you. It's, does that, yeah. Does yeah. that kind of make sense? That's at least that's been my experience is the more that I'm in the word, the more that I am um, yearning and reaching out for, for Christ, the more I feel like I can, can impact my community and be a good steward of that. Yeah. Amen. That, that well, absolutely makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I'm so glad you, that you um, yeah, that was wanted fun. to share that. We love, we love diving. Uh, we always say it's not necessarily a deep dive, but we love diving when we have the opportunity. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's yeah, great. That was awesome. Thank you for letting me. I, I do appreciate that. All yeah. right. Well, so how can folks connect with you? Oh, how can how can people connect with me? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Or, or buy their or buy your book as well. <laughs> well, I Multiple appreciate books. that. Um, well, I'm on social media. Okay. Do uh, Twitter, uh, California Luke W. Just just a W. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm also on Instagram, which we may change the name, but right now it's Luke write stories okay good uh, the, the ways you can contact me if you want I, i'm even fine with an email um luke inkling at hotmail.com awesome uh, please send me an email uh if you want to ask me a question so cool this was so awesome thank you so much for joining us today we love when when we have no idea who the guests are <laughs> yeah <laughs> very very often they're personal friends or you know family members and so when we get someone who is super talented uh, you know, and we don't know them, and we're just like, "Hey, you want to be in our podcast?" And, and they, they say, say yes. yes. <laughs> it's it's oh. so great, it's so so God ordained. It's yes. the best. 
<laughs> well, you guys took a leap of faith on me. I, I appreciate it. I am. Yeah, this this has been a wonderful experience. I, I'm so glad, Diane, that you called. You reached yeah, out. Yeah, this is awesome. Great. And you guys, they, thank you for just being encouraging to me and, and what I'm doing. Absolutely. Excellent. Well, thank you so much and have a great rest of your Friday. You do the same. Thanks again for having me. Bye. 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 Thank you guys for listening to our podcast with Luke. This episode was made possible through generous listeners and friends like you, and we are so very grateful to all of our supporters. If you would like to sponsor an episode, you can head over to thecollaborationconversation.org and click sponsor an episode. For more information on Project Brickworks, visit us online at projectbrickworks.org. Subscribe to our newsletter or text BRICK to 55498 to get the latest news and updates. We love you all. Be blessed, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.